if you're a Heroes Hearth fan, you are rooting for Octalysis right now. If you're a Tempo Storm fan, you got to ask yourself when you look across the battleground, what's next, Octalysis? Because Dreadnought, they've been bringing everything except for the kitchen sink so far. The biggest thing, I think, if you're Tempo Storm at this point, now down two games, stop worrying about some of the major wild things unless you're comfortable picking them yourself. Uh, maybe the Medivh. Still be willing to ban out the Medivh because I think that enables too many play styles for Octalysis. But then look to look at some of the elements that you expect the battleground to promote the most and understand that Octalysis is probably going to exploit those to the extreme. So find ways to limit that. And it depends all on the battleground that we actually go to. So well, this next battleground does give you the promote ability because we're going to Full Sky and Foundry. Works on the turret. You made me excited. <laughs> I thought we were going to true old school promote, promote meta even for that matter here. Full Sky and Foundry. So with that in mind, Early game sustain, skirmish capabilities, probably going to be something that stands out a little bit with soft macro pressure within the mid to early game is usually what we see on most drafts within Volskaya Foundry. That means Abathur, I think, is something that stands out very heavily. But if you have to ban the Medivh and the Abathur itself, you open up things like Myab, which also cater to those same kind of rule set here. So I think Tempo is in an interesting position within the draft. And I, I almost wonder if they should need to learn to pick up one of these tools for themselves. This is a map where we've seen teams go Zera tool more often than not. Yeah. This is also where we saw Octalysis. When I thought a Zera tool was coming out, they last pick a Valera. So they have a lot of faith in the Valera pickup. The Medivh, I think that they have to ban, as you said. I think that's a very good point. Because from Tempo Storm Dreadnought, when we saw them in the first part of the year during phase one, their Medivh teams, their Medivh comps weren't that great. And that was with a very well-oiled machine that they had. Yeah, they Since were, then, it's it's been non-existent. Yeah, they were in peak form during that time frame, right? At the top of North America when that happened. And even then, it was like, can you really function with the Medivh? It almost was a kind of step back for yeah. them as a roster. And as you said, it's been very much a kind of disappearing selection. They did, whether or not they agree or not, they're still going to stick with the Medivh. And they do go away with the Abathur, and that was the one that I thought they might be willing to let through and willing to pick up for themselves. There's a Maev ban. Do we see the standard of Deckard or something Ooh. alike? No, we get an early Genji, which, according to the early game skirmishes, makes sense we would see that in priority. You mentioned the Tempo Storm maybe play around some things they could get on their own. The Maev denial, the Playmaker, definitely I think is the stronger of the two when you look at team coordination giving up the Genji. They're still going to go into the Sergeant Hammer. They have the Deckard. There's nothing to say that they won't go double support again here. This is a map that plays somewhat differently. So let's raise some of the things that were common as the double support compositions for Octalysis, though. One thing that was a common element there was Genji, was existent in both games. They had the opportunity to go with the Divine Shield uh, towards that Genji, right? I believe, at least in the last one, I believe in the first time we got that from them too, they ran it with the Genji. So taking that away, as we see TLV banned out by Octalysis, understandably so, Glorong pretty much put on a clinic last time they played this battleground. Double reset for Tempo Storm. We saw this in a game earlier with a Diablo as a tank yeah. from Heroes Hearth. Unsuccessful in that attempt. Urel is going to be banned out here. Not able to provide that armor and protection towards the Sergeant Hammer, but they do already have the Deckard, which does work very well with the Sergeant. Let me just say that with now that a double reset has been picked, if Octalysis ever intended to double support, they are really happy. <laughs> like, they are really happy right now because Uther double support is one of the best answers to the double reset. It denies the resets. Blaze also denies those quite a bit. Um, but judging by the fact that they don't have the Urel, it's going to make it more difficult to go with the Uther uh, double support, right? Because both times we've also gotten the Urel available for them, which is not the case here as it is third band for Tempo. So we get a Blaze Diva. Resets work on the mech. I think that's one thing people need to, to need to understand. We're going Ana. June finally gets to play Ana. Rejoice. Put your bananas in chat, whatever you feel like. Support June finally coming in here. Mouth Ale to pick up. This is full reset. So the mech, obviously, I think for me is the biggest talking point here because the resets for Leeming and the potential Swift Strike, you get through that, it does make it far more discouraging to play into this style of play if you're Octalysis. But it does cater to the early game skirmishes, which Octalysis is put a lot of emphasis to with this composition. Even so much so they're willing to go with the Tassadar there. <laughs> Man, this is 
an interesting adjustment at the end there of the draft to move into the Tassadar. I think it caters towards the stopping the double reset so much better. But when looking at that first Shrine fight, I actually wonder if the Tassadar is going to be more of a hindrance than it is. I, I look at this first Shrine fight and I go, it's going to open. The Tassadar drops a shield. It looks good. And suddenly you're like, wait a minute. He's forced a dimensional shift. And then the resets go, that's a dead Tassadar. Now it's a dead anybody else. That is what I think is going to end up happening here. But beyond that, if they make it to the team fight, a Tassadar double support into a double reset feels good. I believe it was Prisma that went auto attack Tassadar in a tomb game. He claimed it might have been because of unoptimal circumstances, but this is a team that does stray from the norm. Dreaded is going to be the one on the Tassadar, so we'll see if that is a changeup. The Psy Storm is really powerful late game. Once you complete it, you get the bigger radius and the extra damage at the two tiers that it has, but then Psionic Echo at 16. Because it is a late game talent, the hindrance that you mentioned might really be there for an early game Tassadar. Yeah. Let's check it out, man. Game number three here, Octalysis versus Tempo. Another cool thing to consider here with the Tassadar pickup is he's one of the few supports with uh, as much effective HP adjustment to whatever hero he's contributing his healing resources as a majority supports without costing any healing itself. Which normally you'd be like, well, that sucks. Shielding isn't as good as healing, <laughs> Dread. It doesn't last as long, it's not as effective. And I'd be like, you're right. But when you're facing somebody who removes all healing for a specific amount of time, known as Ana, I want myself some shields. You've got the shields, and then at level four, once that shield bursts, if you opt to go into it, you can get the 25 armor once that shield pops. So there are options here to deal with that. Very good point you bring up, especially against the Ana. We've been waiting for this moment for June for what feels like his entire life. Probably sending a thank you letter out to Smexy. Their last two weeks, Fnatic has run the Ana. Now it'll be an opportunity here for June. There is an element inside of me though, j Hal, that goes, is the Ana selection here more of Tempo Storm just going, we don't know how to beat this, so we're gonna go with things we've been practicing that, you know, here and there, that it's just, hey, you're gonna throw us curveballs, we're throwing you a curveball too. Dread, you, you mentioned the Ana coming in, we're not even going piercing darts here at level one. Yeah, going with the grenade uh, collaboration here. Interesting choice. Amplifying the amount of healing available with the first half of the quest as it moves on. See how that affects the overall healing output. It does remove the standard on a playstyle, not standard, but the common go-to playstyle of using her for the kill potential within the 131 or the four man itself and setting up through the sleep dart. It's not that that isn't an option, but it's not the main focus. You'll never see me playing an Ana, because one, I only really like supports. Two, Ana, stressful, man. Like, oh, she's no, such man. a high skill cap. But if you're telling me I have to try and track down a mouth ale who can teleport, a Genji who's all over the place, I'm not picking piercing darts either to try and heal my targets. Look, you'll get them when you get them. I personally love playing on a, one of the more fun supports in Heroes as we get a five-man collapse over this support camp. First, it's Task going to wear a couple of damage. Scroll of Ceiling is going to get value there, locking down two of Tempo Storm. It's the turrets being laid down. Fan has the uh, Cyber Agility out of there. Glorum falling low with the healing picked up by that camp itself, dropped by Tempo Storm. So j -Hal, though Tempo won the camp, they ended up using the camp just as fast, and because both teams used their turrets, neither team in upper hand through Mercenaries. No. And with all due respect to Ana, I just really don't like supports personally. I like to, to be the one getting the takedowns traded. See if he has his, well, it doesn't matter if you have dimensional shift when you're on full lockdown, that's first blood. But yeah, there are a lot of people out there that love the Ana play style. I'm just a non-support player. She's a fine hero, just not my style. Once you hit seven, you get the mind-numbing darts, you trade it to everybody. You're like, you get less damage, I'm doing all the damages, feels good. Throwing out all the heals here. but. J Hell, one point we got to talk about after that first kill. That was exactly what we were concerned with over Control Point A. It wasn't the exact same situation, but Control Point A is now here. Is the Tacitar going to be able to deny these resets, both in heals and really even just within that Diva, as we already talked about that, enabling resets for Tempo Storm? We'll find out, as it's a full commitment here for Octalysis, a three man for that of Tempo Storm. June continue to go into those grenades. Airstrike at level four passively gives you cooldown reduction. Goku needs to get out of there in a hurry. 
Picks up a few potions on the way back. The triumvirate. Dusting. Seeing that again. Moved off there to make sure he could get the percentage. Now a lot of damage going into him. There goes the mech explosion. Nobody focusing on D.Va. He'll be able to get back into the mech. Interesting choice to mount up and then throw it down. Is this easy mode? Does have some of the cooler voice lines. Justin and team holding position. Defense Matrix goes out as we see the rest of Octalysis. Soaking up some experience in the top lane, dealing with the camp. And then also picking up a turret for themselves to reload, get seven, and try and get control elsewhere on the battleground. It's going to be mirrored, though. Both teams dead even when it comes to the turret itself. We haven't seen the dimensional shift force yet. Justin, not a lot of value when it comes to the buildup of his next, next mecha, which look at all that damage coming out there from Temple Storm, setting him now below 50% drated. There's the dimensional shift. So, do we see the reset opportunity available in the time that that is on cooldown? Justin trying to make space. Cal just sidestepping that jet propulsion by Goku. Turret comes in, Fan goes in on the Genji. Eats a lot of damage on his way out. Has been continuing to make his mark shooting forward. Four more seconds till Drayda does have the dimensional shift. So now no more threat for a while for Octalysis. That camp is still up in the top. I don't know how much is left yet, but we did see Prismat, or excuse me, Drayda go and clear that. So not much threat yet in that top lane. Tempo is going to achieve the nine, or excuse me, Octalysis has achieved the 99% in the overtime. And now Tempo, oh, not even going to go and deny at all there. Actually, full defense back out here. And Jay Howe, it's an interesting decision there. But that is something last time we talked about Ball Sky Foundry, and when we watch a lot of Ball Sky Foundry, even Octalysis is playing it, teams sticking around for that overtime in the long run, even though they're losing it, to where they fall too far behind in experience here. I actually really appreciate that from Temple Storm not committing too much here to control point A. Yeah, you give up the potential level 10 spike as you're alluding to. And this is the difference because just getting the wall, the threat towards 10 is close, but not close enough. If you stall that out another 10, 20 seconds, then the threat is even worse because they're already on top of your fort. The threat of it is almost guaranteed. It's just the threat of them diving behind it is the scary part. Octalis is still wailing away here at top. They do have a pretty easy pickup at the back half of this, purely on tempo too far away from their tens. That'll be where control point B ends up spawning. So well set up here, battleground for Vault Sky Foundry and Octalysis. See if they can force anything in the downtime, still with the 10 advantage. Looks like the support camp's the choice. Cattle cannot make anything happen with this, especially with Glorong still yet, in yet to join the rotation. I mean, there's no chance you go bunny hop here, right? I mean, I am. I mean, Big Shot, just because you get the mech back. Yeah, the mech back is seems like it should be a focus into a double reset composition. I think that is definitely fair. And outside of follow-up to the just jet on top of auto. It, I mean, where are you going? Uh, you could just try and kill it. <laughs> Trixler would be happy. I would be happy. I love that audio. It's one of my favorite. <laughs> I can it, make it for you. I'm sure. Do it the whole car ride back home. Oh, You're I, welcome, Dreadnought. Thank you. I am. <laughs> I can't wait. I am just jumping out of my seat. Me too. Me too. Now, we do get Dragon Blade again. With the nano boost, could be terrifying. You also have. I mean, could be. It is terrifying. You also have Li Ming that you can nano boost. So that target. See as it comes in. Interesting choice to go with the Nano Boost, but then still go with the Calamity versus the Seeker build, even though we went into Triumvirate. Uh, this is a unique adjustment here from Temple. When normally you run a double reset composition, you poke and prod so much around the objective itself that you don't really have enough HP for Leeming to be able to gain value out of that Calamity. And I'm really looking for if that becomes a problem as these teamfight happen. Yeah, I, it's concerning enough that I wonder if that's going to be a major setback as this game moves forward. Because uh, Li Ming won't be able to sit back and use the CDR, but she won't be able to move forward and secure any of the kills either. And she's got massive CDR. Oh, man, this is high risk, high reward is the best way to put it. If it works out, it's going to look real good. If not, Octalis is going to be looking at 3-0. Octalis with a threat of 13 will move in towards this mid fort. 
clear off the minion wave, move forward behind the Sergeant Hammer. With the Li Ming, the threat is more there than not with some of the other comps. As you can see, Cattle goes in, Dwarf tosses, gets the stun, but nice shielding there provided by Drayden. Yeah, that was so kind of predictable that I feel like that was Cattle trying to bait a cooldown to see if they could get a reinitiation afterwards. But Octalis is ended up kind of retreating here. 13 picked up now by them. As we know, their Storm Bolt goes off. Adjusting, wasted no time, just throws out the mech. June in a bad spot. Unable to make it out as the sail while and listen is there. He is first to drop along with the bunker. Now Glarong trying to cut his way out. Storm oh Bolt used, but all that damage and Justin comes <laughs> in with those thrusters, finds the second kill. Now 11 seconds out from control point B. And Octalis is just not letting anything up whatsoever here. Now forcing the siege. Man, that was a lot of damage from Vin, but this fort will lie victim to the hands of Octalis. Getting the start, Fan goes in with the Swift Strike, trying to keep this fort alive. We'll go down momentarily. Blaze already made his way to the top control point. Cattle very low. It's just in continuing the harassment here. I was wondering if there was going to be a little bit of a world where, uh, you know, I like oftentimes with Genji, anytime that you can possibly find like massive deflect value to risk that all in kind of playmaking capabilities as the game moves on. But Especially we, with Psy Storm. Yeah, but we didn't even move into the deflect CDR, so that is definitely not going to be a late game option for Temple Storm. But yeah, into Napalm and Psy Storm, uh, it's one of my just stack the damage and be like, all right, I'm going to really. You could hear the ticks on <laughs> yeah. that last one. Yeah. Got the wheels turning. For Goku on Blaze, going Suppressive Fire, which does reduce spell power when you hit with those flames. We'll see how effective that can be. There's going to be last rites used. That could be a reset potential for Li Ming. Justin will all have to work to get the mech back. Hits nice. one big shot. Yeah, that was a really big, big shot, if you will. Uh, now, look at that Haradra cube, actually. Bud's big playmaking. That scroll is sealing. is putting them in a lose-lose scenario as the stay a while. And listen, comes out from over the wall. The bunker there. Vin is stuck in a corner, but so is Bud's as he is first. No, not to he drop. Gets he gets in the bunker. And he snipes. He snipes out the damage they go through as the diva mecha explosion is there. But Justin, one big shot is all it would take. Fan swift strikes away. Goku now kiting well. One frame floor. Oh, he misses. Oh, and they get mouth ale. This is going from bad to worse for Tempo Storm. Now they're looking at staggered deaths. Four members go down on the side of Tempo Storm. Noctalis is dreadnought. Threat of 16. Sergeant Hammer is here. We'll move forward. They are going to be threatening keep momentarily. I think they're threatening more than a keep at this point here, because this is a big advantage for them. They don't have, I was going to say the best but I'm wrong about that. Crossfire mixed with ha uh, late game post 16, Tassadar and a Sergeant Hammer. Three extremely successful seizures. First keep, down. See what, what, what we get else with this here. Interesting trade off situation, Jay. How 30 seconds remain. Likely to get more damage to the middle keep front wall than you are anything else rather than rotating towards bottom. But bottom is where the next objective is. So do you want to better prep with that 30 second window toward the highest XP value or better prepping for the long run? of Volskaya Foundry. And the answer, pretty clear as we see this protector kind of making his way downtown, walking fast, tempo's fast. <laughs> I didn't mean to originally, but it just happened. You can't deny that song <laughs> when it starts. Three level lead. I didn't know you would commit, by the way. Uh, speaking of committing, Tempo Storm, they're going to have to commit to a team fight inevitably with a three level lead and a talent tier advantage. The sieging on this bottom port will continue here for Octalysis. And that psionic echo for Tassadar, one of the best sieging tools in the game now, especially with that level seven. Malthale's on a flank, but he's already sniffed out by Prismet. Camp questionably started here by Octalysis. Now really going to be started. Goku eats the Storm Bolt, Justin, Thrusters. Look at the scroll of ceiling. Stay a while and listen as well. Hits a two-man Goku with the Jet Propulsion. Fan tries to go in, but quickly Octalysis deny him entrance there. He is already dead. Bud's tanking up the team there with that Ancient Blessings. Auto attack into Caterpillar as Glorong trying to get the damage onto Justin, throwing out the curtain, but Cattle gets the oil. Big shot. Oh, Roderick. Oh my goodness. June. 
goes down. Do he we get another one? Oh, my big shot. Octalysis does it and gets three kills for nothing there. And now Siege up in this bot lane. The writing is starting to be on the wall, and it is an ancient scroll here. Because Deckard walking forward, tanking that. The rest of Octalysis moving forward. They're going to get keep number two down here at 14 minutes in. And if they play their cards right, Dread, we've seen teams in the past. Now's the time you can be patient, get level 20, oh, yeah. and then go. Octalysis, hopefully they have a short memory and then learn from it because it was just on this battleground last week where they had a similar lead. And they gave up one pick, gave up a second, and then things spiraled out of control. Yeah. I think they, they most definitely learned from that. See how patient they are for the rest of this game. And then at 20, try and take the ultimate team fight protector in the game. The one thing I find interesting, based on that exact kind of thought process you gave, not only for the Prismat, who ended up being the first to get caught out, and then later adjusting later in that game that you're uh, kind of talking about now, is Tempo, they had only two fights to choose, one over the support camp and one over this camp at the same talent here. And notice how late those rotations are. They didn't even question if they could commit to the Shaman camp. Actually, Justin, he has the mecha now. Goku moves up. Still no 20 available for Octalysis. Are they going to get too high? They got the lockdown. They're like, oh, we could. Oh, wait a minute. And there was so much damage in return. 20 is almost here. There's a camp available at the top left. They can use that to push down that top lane with the catapults. Instead, they're making their way downtown. I know. Yeah. It's a little weird because they could wait for catapult lethal pressure on the top half of the battleground, but that camp there is just going to really, you know, slow the pacing of that. Justin, falling low, has the opportunity to go in the mech as the last rights actually was used onto the mech itself. Lee Ming. Lee Ming already dropped. Goku furthering the advance of Octalysis. Cattle trying to make it out. Torpedo Rocky dash. Ends up landing. June drops next. Fan with the switch strike out. Caterpillar is not going to be able to last long as Buds gets to stay a while. And listen, that's Glaron going down. Three members of Temple Storm dead. And Octalysis make their way to the core. I don't know what I'm watching. This Octalysis team has been a team reborn since the Western Clash. Dread, they were one of the better performing teams at the Western Clash. And then they came back from the Western Clash and said, that's not good enough. That is not good enough. They said, we should have been, could have been six and one during part number one of phase two. Well, they didn't beat a top three team then, but they did so now, taking out Tempo Storm 3-0. And they didn't do it by happenstance. They controlled so many of these games. 13 to two in terms of kills, I believe, over the last game. A 13 minute Dragon Shower game against Tempo Storm, their best battleground. It is uh, hard to paint this as if it wasn't Octalysis just walking in and saying, we are the better team here this week. And even if that wasn't the words out of their mouth, the actions from their hands surely felt that way, that that was the tone. Buds gave them the hands, yeah, that's with, for sure. At the end there, he was giving the old stickerino there with that 16 pickup, just. I, I saw the stun there, and he just walked forward and casually was just beating everybody over the head with it. I think of it, whenever I think of, uh, you know, Buds or in that type of situation, or just anybody when they go with Decker with the Angel Blessing and the Staff Stone at 16, uh, it's just the Hong Kono impression of Haymaker. It's just. <laughs> Temple Storm. They fall to three losses in the loss column. Yeah. They still find themselves in prime position. It now takes them, I don't want to say completely out of the running. We'll have to double check on those numbers, but it definitely takes them further out of contention for that automatic qualifier. For Octalysis, I think it's impossible for them, but their next opponent is against Heroes Hearth, a team that was watching this and said, we would like if you beat Tempo Storm because that makes it easier for us to get to BlizzCon. But Heroes Hearth now has to think, boy, Sunday's matchup, it looks a little different than they probably anticipated coming into the weekend. It very much does have to be, and even more so considering with their circumstances with drafting already, that's got to be a concern. Then now going against Octalysis, that seems to be at the forefront of some of the ways that they're able to gain the upper hand compared to most of North America. So it's a pro and a con for two reasons. I, for the, pro, uh, the cons on what I listed before, but I think it's a pro in the fact that if you can know that an opponent is going to do something through the draft, then that means research can always help you. And you can at least use time and information to hopefully find a way to maybe limit some of the damage. Let's see if we can get some information out of Mr. Big Shot, I think is what we're going to have to call him now. We've got Justin here. Justin, 
I, I don't know what to say, man. You guys continue to surprise us, and every time we say what's next, you guys have an answer for it. How are you feeling after the victory today? Uh, I'd say we're definitely feeling pretty good. Uh, Tempo Storm is a long-term or long, you know, long rival of ours, so it's good to get the 3-0. Well, every time we talk to you guys, it's a matter of we've got more, we've got more. And here we continue to ask, what more do you have? We saw Samuro today. We saw the return of D.Va. We saw Tank Uther. Dreadnought was talking about being able to prepare with information from other teams. And we heard from Prismat during his interview. He said, we're not holding any strategies back this time in the double weekend. Is there more for Sunday? Yeah, of course. Uh... I mean, I can't go into detail about what it is. They'll have to find out on Sunday against Heroes Hearth. But yeah, we've got more, and they can try to ban out our strategies, but it's probably not going to work. There's not really a way that we can not get what we want in the draft. So they can get what they want, and we can get what we want, but what we get will probably be better. Well, Justin, I talked to you guys a lot during the first part of Phase 2, and it was constantly a matter of we're trying to find our drafts, we're trying to figure out who we are, we're trying to figure out our roles. You guys played so many heroes that it was almost impossible to explain to people the way you guys play. You come back from Clash, we've seen you against three teams, but this is a top three team. Now, do you feel 100% confident moving forward that this is the style and you finally got it? Yeah, I'd say the first uh, part of the phase, we had to do a bit of experimenting for the entire phase, I suppose, and we had to lose a bunch <laughs> of games, but that's what you've got to do, I guess, to figure out, you know, what you really need to play. I think we didn't really know what to play or, like, what worked best for us in the first part because we were trying too hard to force meta picks every time, and we were just trying to copy what other people were running, and even though we maybe didn't think that was the best strategy, it was just the easiest thing to do, and so we came back and we decided, let's just play what we're best at and what we think is actually the best. So now we have a weird little meta that I guess only we are drafting unless other teams start copying it. <laughs> a weird little meta? I think little might be the wrong term there, my <laughs> friend. I think it's a big meta. We're still <laughs> trying to figure out on our end, but uh, I'm going to send you over to Dread. Justin, I've got to ask, when it comes to the Avatar Summerl composition of Dragonshire, uh, number one, where does the kind of inspiration slash thought process come from that kind of play style uh, for you guys? Well, I think that's a strategy that's been shown a long time ago. I'm pretty sure I might be wrong. I think maybe Team Liquid ran it a long time ago. No, I'm right. not sure. I'm pretty sure a EU team, yeah, a European team ran it like a year ago or more. And, um, so that's just something neat, I guess. Hmm? And, and so I was just asking, was it purely from that? Or was it, uh, you know, is Goku just busting out the Samuro and just be like, guys, I think we can end up running this here? Uh, you know, or was it very much, again, just seeing other parts of the world end up playing that? Because if so, I can't help but feel like almost any roster ADRD has been on has got a lot of inspiration for you guys. Uh, so I guess it's a little bit of seeing other teams running it and knowing that it works. And then that's a small part of it. I guess the bigger part is... Abathur is pretty prevalent in the meta right now, so we tend to take what heroes are good. We're not just going to pick five really bad heroes and just try to run that, because that doesn't make sense. So we'll take like Abathur, for example, who's a really strong hero in the meta right now. And then Goku, which is the best Samuro in NA, without a doubt. Like, we even ran it at BlizzCon last year. Samuro against uh, Ballistics, I believe. <laughs> so Goku's just a great Samuro, so the two just come together, and we have Abba Samuro. And so then here with the success against Tempo Storm, and as we've said, you know, uh, we were kind of talking about storyline with you guys being able to take this against a top three team in such dominant fashion. I just want to know, do you guys have, you know, if you are the team to represent North America at BlizzCon and get that playoff kind of spot for yourselves, do you have any concerns? Or are there any measures you're going to take to hopefully be able to make sure that the success of these comps translates on beyond North America? Well, I think for NA, it's probably the best, that we could have going into BlizzCon to draft like a weird meta that makes people uncomfortable that people aren't used to playing against. Because traditionally NA hasn't really just stood up and beat up any Korean teams. That doesn't really happen. Typically the Koreans are just, they have an established meta that they've been playing for the past like three years almost. That's almost always the same. Like the style that the Koreans play tends to be the same thing and they just substitute other heroes for it. So trying to play against them with the same kind of strategy is not gonna work. It just doesn't make sense. So our best bet is probably to catch them off guard with weird picks. So if we can keep refining our weird meta, that's what I think is probably our best best bet. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to watch that kind of evolve here in North America, and I look forward to watching guys more further this weekend against Heroes Hearth. I'm going to send you back to jail. Well, Justin, let's go back to the meta part because I've seen teams 
multiple teams in the past. They, they, you look at Team Liquid, they started to run the Zarya Lunara a lot. They started to run Lost Vikings, but they started to get repetitive and teams figured it out. So far, you guys haven't fallen into the repetitive category. How do you continue to diversify your drafts to continue to innovate without falling into that trap of being the same old weird team over and over? So the strategies that tend to work, if they're good enough, we will have adaptations to those strategies. So for example, if someone were to ban one of the heroes from the D-Shark comp and we still wanted to run that comp, we could still run that comp. It would be a little bit different, but we could still run it. So basically, we're not satisfied just running the same comp into the ground over and over again. We have multiple variations of all of our weird comps that we run that are all based off of the strongest heroes in the meta. So there's not too much repetition. Like if teams try to figure out how to beat it, we can just adapt a little bit. And if we start losing to meta picks, we just change up our strategy and practice. Well, let's look forward to this weekend. This was a mammoth weekend for you guys. Tempo Storm and Heroes Heart, the top two teams in North America. It doesn't get any clearer than that, that if you can take down one, if not both of these opponents, you've solidified yourself as one of the top teams. Obviously, you had to make up for it a lot in your record. Seeing what Heroes Hearth is going through now, do you feel like this is the, the weekend for you guys to strike while the iron is hot? How much more confidence do you have coming into this weekend, given the circumstances, for you to take down potentially both top two teams in North America? Uh, I wouldn't say that our confidence level really changed too much with the circumstances. It's obviously unfortunate for them, and I guess in a way it's a little bit fortunate for us, but I don't think we're really thinking about it that way. We're just, I don't know, going and have to play the games. It's unfortunate to have the Tempo and Heroes Hearth in the same weekend, but it doesn't really change anything for us mentally, I don't think. We're going to take them just as seriously as if uh, it was last week and they still had Arthlon. So when we look at Heroes Heart, they're a team. They've run combos of their own. They've kind of done things outside of the ordinary from time to time, but never to the links that you guys have. Is there anything when you strategize, when you look at a game plan, you look at the enemy opponent, is there anything specifically that you guys will attempt to do differently against this opponent? Or is it just, we're doing what we do, and that's good enough to work? Or is there specific strategies you develop for each game? So certain teams definitely have certain heroes and strategies that they crutch upon, and we definitely take that into consideration when drafting against them, but uh, for our core strategies, they're not really going to change. It just we have our own meta that we run, and it should work against everyone the same, because if we didn't think it was the best things we could run, we wouldn't be running them. Well, it's working out so far, and it's entertaining as heck. I can tell you that much. It's fun to watch, <laughs> and uh, congratulations on the victory today. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jeho. Uh, shout outs to Twitch chat. Keep it up. Really proud of you guys. Um, <laughs> shout outs to you two for casting. Keep it up. Proud of you guys. And <laughs> shout outs to our org, uh, Team Octalysis, uh, the Octalysis group. Appreciate it. Uh, they've done great things for us and they've been very helpful. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Shout outs to my team, of course. All right. Thanks, Justin. Enjoy the victory. We'll see you again on Sunday. Thanks. Have you know the proper response to that was. Justin, proud of you. Keep, Keep it, it up. up. <laughs> and just call it a day. <laughs> I missed it. I missed it. Uh, Justin, if you're watching, because uh, we are on a delay here. We're proud of you. We are Keep indeed it up. proud of you. Just uh, continue to entertain us. That's all that we ask. It is nice to kind of get this fresh feel to shake up the meta. Yeah. I would say it shakes up the meta, but it literally is like, all right, here's the meta. Here's some heroes you could sprinkle in. But what if we just morphed into a different meta, and that's what we have with Octalysis? Yeah, it is. It is actually pretty inspiring to see this from a North American team. And again, I think we need more time and sample size before we can truly say, you know, is this the real deal in some way, shape, or form? But there is definitely enough backing to it, too. There is some After weight. today, yeah. for sure. And so I think the coolest thing about it is that if this isn't something we haven't ever un you know seen before it but it's never within north america and i think that is the biggest thing is whether or not that is be for better or for worse right because those teams almost always have success within europe but then internationally maybe not the most compared to the rest of europe and so it's like whether or not that's a regional problem whether or not that is a again a north american one it, 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 we're suddenly going to have another way to look at competitive heroes and what is the most efficient way to study the game and play the game based on just the innovation of octalysis alone We'll see them again on Sunday. Let's take a look at our Saturday schedule as we have more action underway.
So we'll kick things off in Europe with Team Liquid taking on Leftovers. Team Liquid still trying to sit at the top, falling to Dignitas last. We'll look to recover against Leftovers, who are still trying to solidify their spots. Roll20 trying to climb out of their hole, picking up a win last weekend, seeing if they can continue the climb before we hit North America. And that is where we're going to have Team Freedom taking on No Tomorrow there. Team Freedom wanting to maintain their dominance within the region, whereas No Tomorrow wanting to show the development, uh, developments that they have had here with some of the changes that have definitely been growing here and end the day with LFM Esports against Endemic, which Endemic has had positive responses since their role swaps coming in with, you know, Big E moving over to the Sapporo, it looked good, but then they played Octalysis and it felt like it was just dominance, but now seeing that against Tempo, you go probably understandably so. so it's going to be cool to be able to see Endemic here perform this weekend. Yeah, rumor has it we'll have the substitute for tomorrow for Endemic. That's going to be the team that we'll watch tomorrow. But that will do it for us here tonight at HGC North America. We will see you back here tomorrow for more NA action. Until then, see you in the Nexus. Temple Storm is miles ahead when it comes to this shrine. The amount of damage that Fan was able to put onto Goku was insane, and now Goku goes in without that Ardent Defender. D-Shield is back up, see if it needs to be used here. Instead, oh! it's time for him to pop off. There's kill number one. There's going to be Swift Strike. There's kill number two. Swift Strike number three. Cattle surviving through that healing static, but that's going to be a triple kill here as Drayden turned that fight. Scratch that catapult over, that'll make a triple catapult stack in about a minute in favor of Octalysis. So can they delay this out into their favor? They go in, look at that switch strike right onto a trap. Divine Shield pop, can they get the reset? June goes down, reset one. Can Drayden find another? Oh, no! Interrupted by the Lornado. The damage come through, he is going to be able to kite away, but 33 skeletal defenders in favor of Tempo Storm. Through the Lornado actually interrupted him. I think he was about to get another reset onto that mouth hill. Instead, speaking of reset. Well, not gonna land that time. Drayden gonna move forward. Focus on the fan. Shield comes out from Vin in a second. Nope, just out of range. Dude, I'm telling you, post level seven, that's insane. It's gonna rip up. Like, everybody on that back line. It's pretty squishy. There's a double root in there. Now keeping control of that front line. Prismat coming down in comes another attempt. Drayden gets the jump onto Vin. Maybe you can make that happen, but now Octalysis has a big enough lead that I don't think that's going to be a true statement for much longer. Iron Skin drop, Concussion Mine pushing out Cattle for a little bit. He's, he gets silenced. Goku throws down a lot of damage there, and that is another kill as Dimensional Shift comes out. Uh, now, look at that Haraka Cube actually. Bud's big playmaking. That scroll of ceiling is putting them in a lose lose scenario as the stay a while and listen comes out from over the wall. The bunker there. Vin is stuck in a corner, but so is Bud's as he is first. No, not the he drop. Gets in. He gets in the and bunker. He snipes. he snipes out the damage they go through as the Diva Mecha explosion is there, but Justing, one big shot is all. It would take fan switch strikes away. Goku now kiting well. One frame floor. Oh, he misses. Oh, and they get mouth ill. This is going from bad to worse for Tempo Storm. Now they're looking at staggered dust by Octalysis. Now really going to be started. Goku eats the Storm Bolt. Justin thrusters. Look at this scroll of ceiling. Stay a while and listen as well. Hits a two man Goku with the jet propulsion. Fan tries to go in, but quickly Octalysis deny him entrance there. He is already dead. Buds tanking up the team there with that Ancient Blessings auto attack into Caterpillar as Warung trying to get the damage onto Justin, throwing out the curtain, but Cattle gets the oil. Big shot. Oh, Roderick. Oh my goodness. Dude goes down. Do he we get another one? Oh my big shot. Octalis is pressure on the top half of the battleground, but that camp there is just going to really, you know, slow the pacing of that. Justin falling low, has the opportunity to go in the mech as the last rights actually was used onto the mech itself. Li Ming. Li Ming already dropped. Goku furthering the advance of Octalysis. Cattle trying to make it out. Torpedo dash. Ends up landing. June drops next. Fan with the switch strike out. Caterpillar is not going to be able to last long as Buds gets to stay a while. And listen, that's Glaron going down. Three members of Temple Storm dead. And Octalysis make their way to the core. I don't know what I'm watching. This Octalysis team has been a team reborn since the Western Clash. Dread, they were one of the better performing teams at the Western Clash. And then they came back from the Western Clash and said, that's not good enough.